Hi, welcome to Sampath on Heiger session three. Uh, this is our third recording, hence the title session three. Um, before we begin our reading of Heidegger's Being in Time, just uh, some preliminary remar remarks, feedback I've been getting. A uh, couple of things. I tend to uh, speak fast, think fast, and oftentimes I may, from your end of the recording, it sounds a bit muffled. The auto transcript for both Zoom and also um, the postings on YouTube, when you use the CC to get the subtitles, may not be clear. So my recommendation is a poor solution perhaps, but plug in your headphones and just crank up the volume all the way to the max. Um, it's partially my fault the way I speak and the intonation of my voice. Uh, as mentioned, I, I tend to think very quickly and speak very quickly and speak with my mind, uh, which is not always a good thing. You should think before you speak, but that's, that's how I operate. So that's, that's one point, the sound and the volume put the headphones on, turn it up, and it should be okay. The next piece is I'm gonna do my best to speak into the camera so you can see me directly. Um, one question I've gotten is that, are you reading from lecture notes? Is this how you teach? In this particular context, I wanna be this, I wanna reach you know, a wide audience so we can try to address a lot of people's concerns and issues. And you know, although it, it appears to be an academic type discussion, it's really, I think, deeper than that. Quite frankly, it's about the times we're living in and not just the reading of a single, single philosopher's text. So um, the only time I'm going to read from something is when I'm literally reading a passage or a paragraph in Heidegger's book. And we said we're going to spend an hour long recording every day, or try to anyway, on a single passage or page. We can only handle that much of the text at a time and then have a larger you know, explication, discussion of that. So the only time you see my eyes moving, it moves around a lot, but when I will tell you that I'm reading from Heidegger's text, I'll tell you the page number so you can follow along. But that's really just re doing a, a quick reading of a paragraph for a page, which doesn't take that long. But when you, the rest of it, 90% of our discussions is literally me just talking, oftentimes. Uh, oftentimes, all the time off the top of my head, perhaps stream of consciousness, um, there's pros and cons to that approach, but that's what we're taking here. This is, I'm not reading from any notes or um, any uh, lecture papers, regardless of where you see my eyes on the screen. Last point is that my take here is not claiming to be the only interpretation of Heidegger. It's not claiming to be the right or definitive interpretation of Heidegger. There are tons and tons of Secondary literature across the world, I'd mentioned, you could be the most referenced philosopher since Aristotle, 3,300 years ago, um, excuse me, 2,300 years ago, 300 BC. So, you know, this is not the only interpretation. If you go onto YouTube, the internet, you're gonna find tons of material if you want PowerPoints or other philosophers lecturing on, on being in time and hyper, you can find that. As I'd mentioned in the first session, I've repeated in the second session, I, I envision this, Engagement, this encounter is speaking to our, our human condition, the broader context of the what we're living through right now with the pandemic crisis, that's how it began. But I'd also mention that I wanna contrast whatever we're gonna to try to get out of Heidegger's text, contrast that material with what we find in some of the world's religions, which is a deep inviting passion of mine. A lot of people come from an experience and upbringing, a position of faith. Some people grow up in a certain religion and maybe change it convert to others. Others are loosely interested in spiritual matters to make sense of life, the meaning of life and death, mass death, the quarantine, individual death, our obligations to one another. So religion is so key for most of humanity. Philosophy in that regard is um, maybe a poor substitute. It's not only esoteric and abstract and difficult to work through, it doesn't have broad appeal. Truth you know, truth be saying, truth be told. But religion does, and we know that. And quite frankly, a lot of viewers may have a, a religious perspective on, on what's happening. And I wanna take that very seriously. I wanna honor that, appreciate that, um, and, and uplift that. So there it is. This is, uh, it's, I'm not reading from anything, just like right now. This is how I normally talk and think, and I tend to think off the top of my head. So that, that's how we're gonna move along every, every hour. 
I appreciate you tuning in and your interest, and uh, I, I thank you for your for your continued support for this for this effort. So typically, before I start a reading and go right into Heidegger, I, I take a step back and I, I try to check in and see, you know, how we might be processing what what's happening. You know, the more we go along from days and months into the quarantine, the isolation, the social distancing, regardless of what governments are telling us, oh, we can you know, lift the restrictions then, and this model is showing us now that, okay, there'll be a flattening, and eventually hospitalizations and deaths are going to go down. But we know that regardless of when that might be, there's a radical shift taking place, whether we know it or not, obviously in our behaviors and, and going forward, but a radical shift that's probably taking place in our consciousness in our sense of embodiment and how we feel when we are part of a society. And oftentimes, even in crises like this, one wonders if we are losing sight of the most vulnerable of us, people that can't social distance, poor communities, the afflicted communities of color that whenever there's a national crisis emergency, they tend to be the hardest hit for economic reasons, social reasons, cultural reasons in the United States, pervasive structures of racism. Think about people with disability, just trying to get through a normal day when there's no crisis. It's just normal. Everybody gets to leave their place and they get to go out and they get to go to the beach or have fun or go here or do that, et cetera, et cetera. But think about how in, in normal times for the majority of the able-bodied population, there are people with disability that have internalized social distancing their whole life, or at least from the time that they acquired their disability. So we have to go into a space philosophically to understand a couple of things, I think, you know, in our, in our times. Truly, when we think about a radical shift in human existence and life, when we think about how our own individual lives, regardless of what our circumstances or conditions are being affected, you might think, well, you're concerned about yourself, you're concerned about your immediate family, you're concerned about, of course, their safety and security. Most of the time, most people are. Maybe your neighbors, you have a close relationship to your neighbors and you, you tend to come together and share resources when, when there's an emergency or there's a situation. Your community, your town, your state, your country. But one wonders, you know, given this crisis, future crises, and I'm gonna give us a couple of examples of like, astronomically larger crises that could be hitting us right now, of which we're not even prepared because existentially and philosophically, not just in terms of our resources and planning and society, existentially we are not at all remotely prepared to handle a cataclysmic event. Let's say, you know, a level five type disaster that can wipe out a third of the human population. And I'm gonna give us a couple of examples there. But you widen out from your most immediate sphere of who you're concerned about. We talk about the who of who are we, who is this entity that's gonna pose this question of meaning of being in Heidegger. And you might branch out a little bit to family members, community, colleagues, friends, et cetera. But given the potentiality, the future that maybe a hundred years ago, humanity couldn't experience, but today they can. You know, we talk about the asteroid hitting the earth that wiped out all you know, mammals and reptiles, the dinosaurs. We weren't around at the time. And uh, an interesting counterfactual that was on YouTube I saw the other day about you know, five seconds of oxygen because a lot of people are, are passing away, not just because of the virus, but it causes an inflammation in the body to overreact and it's the breathing, hence the need for the ventilators. The breathing is what you know, people are essentially suffocating within their, their own body's response to the virus. But it, under normal circumstances, you know, we could probably go five seconds without oxygen. You, you go into water, when you swim, you hold your breath. You can do it right now, hold your breath for five seconds, meditate, you know, these kinds of things. But the issue there is that if the earth lost most of its oxygen, and yeah, you can hold your breath for a certain amount of time, that's really not the issue. It's the oxygen that keeps all the um, structures in place, the infrastructures, the buildings, they'd collapse because of the way they're, they're, the compounds and the chemical nature of how those are held up. Steel would start to melt together. That would change a lot of things that are made of steel and the earth's core itself would start to collapse on itself very quickly so within five seconds everything would be destroyed along with uh, you know and us with with everything else the earth 
And, and these are not things that we normally think about when we wake up and say, oh my gosh, that's going to happen. The chances of that happening are still pretty slim. But there are other types of events. There could be an asteroid. There could be the super volcano at Yellowstone that flares up in hundreds of millions of years. But if it does, it's one third of the United States still be blanketed. So it, it forces us to think of them now in relationship to moments like that, even if they're hypothetical. To dig in deeply to understand like, how is the human species actually programmed internally with regard to its sense of survival? Not with regard to the individual. And typically most individuals will do everything they can to survive. And so will the medical establishment, the Hippocratic Oath, preserve and save life at all costs. Don't take life. Massively complicated debates about physician assisted dying and suicide. Some nations have legalized it, other states here in the US have, others are against it. You need to save and preserve life at all costs. So I put all that as a, as a kind of context pretext um, out there to, to frame how we, how we want to think about these issues. We have no philosophical foundations now to think about why we would be more concerned about ourselves individually and our immediate connections as opposed to others. Every human life, as I said, is infinitely valuable as an infinite point and place and time where people were born and for reasons that should be cherished. There are people who through this pandemic will suffer even more. We may take it for granted living in a peaceful setting what about the refugees? What about people in conflict zones? People with disabilities all over the world, one billion of the human population. People that suffer under some kind of uh, oppression. It could be gender, it could be sexuality, it could be race, a religious minority in a certain context. You know, how, how would th that ongoing suffering be exacerbated when you think about these kind of cataclysmic, you know, global humanitarian events? And philosophers have to ask too, why? Why, after thousands of years of technological and scientific progress and industrialization and cures to previous pandemics and viruses and solving polio or TB or malaria, et cetera, don't have the vaccine for malaria yet, but you know, other things have been um, eradicated, smallpox. So as we move along in this technological progress, yet here we are more vulnerable, perhaps more distant, more insecure, more apathetic to others suffering than we have through throughout most of the 20th century. The 20th century was afflicted by massive global wars. And we have ongoing systemic wars now, still spotty wars throughout the world. People are suffering. And yet it takes a moment like this where all of our assumptions are suspended and our own individual lives are completely turned upside down for us to think. And if you recall from our last session, session two, when we opened up with the Ford as I transitioned out of being in time in Heidegger, the great Greek translation, uh, the Greek passage that the, the translators translated from Heidegger's sermon, uh, the ancient Greeks asked about, you know, are we at all remotely perplexed by this, what we mean by being? And Heidegger picks up on that from the ancient Greeks and in his context in the 1920s resumes, renews, tries to like reawaken that. Do we know what we mean by being? Not really. Are we perplexed about the fact that we don't have the ability to think about it? We're not doing that either. So we're either we're, we don't know what we're talking about when we talk about being. And then on top of that, we're not even reflecting on the fact that we don't have the ability to think about it. So he's going to launch this massively ambitious project to take it on for us. Which leads us to the introduction of the text and of the book. And that is on page 21. It is the introduction. So I'm going to now move to that so you can see me reading from the text. I'll start that in a second. But it's page 21, Harper and Row, 1962, Being in Time. The PDF is online. Just have to put Being, Being in Time PDF. Click on it. You'll get the full, full book. You can use the print version, the book I, I had in my hand the other day. Or you can, you can read it online. So the introduction, which I'll start reading from, and then we'll move into, this shouldn't take more than a few minutes, and then I will go back to the camera or the other side of the screen, and you'll, you'll see, um, I'll begin my, my explication. 
in light of what I just said about what is mass death, what is individual death, what does life mean when it, when it comes to these you know, extremely uncanny times that, that human beings can't predict and the unpredictable nature of human life itself, that at a second it could disappear and yet we don't, we're not programmed to think that way, but it could be a reality. What do we do? Okay, so introduction, being in time, Heidegger's work. Introduction, exposition of the question of the meaning of being, the necessity, structure, and priority of the question of being. Section one, if you see the little one with the paragraph P next to it, there are 83 of these tiny sections, many sections in each chapter. There are many chapters in a division, division one, many chapters in division two, but there's sections, the little sections in each of the chapter. This is the first one. There are 83 sections in the whole book. So you might think, okay, we'll spend every video recording on one section. And therefore we'll do 83 of these sessions. But as I mentioned before, some sections are gonna have multiple paragraphs and pages. And all we can really do is spend time with one paragraph or one page for an hour in, in every setting and see how long it takes to get to the end of the book. Days, months, years, we'll, we'll, let's see how it goes. So here's section one in, in, in the introduction, chapter one in the introduction. Section the necessity for explicitly restating the question of being. This question has today been forgotten. Even though in our time, we deem it progressive to give our approval to metaphysics again. It is held that we have been exempted from the exertions of a newly rekindled, and many offers a Greek phrase, gigonatamagia peritis lucius. I have to turn to my colleagues to consult on the longer Giga uh, to Machia, but Perite Susius about, about being, you know, some question about being, something about being, you know, concerned about being. Yet the question we are touching upon is not just any question. It is one which provided a stimulus for the researches of Plato and Aristotle, only to subside from then on as it can ital italicized as a theme for actual investigation. There's a footnote that the translators deal with, with regard to investigation. What these two men achieved, Plato and Aristotle, the two big ancient Greeks, was to persist through many alterations and retouchings down to the logic of Hegel. There's Heidegger, that guy's Hegel. And what they rested with the utmost intellectual effort from the phenomenon Fragmentary and incipient though it was, has long since become trivialized. What is he saying there? Okay, so I'm going to pause, step back, and see me talking. I'm not reading from anything, just me responding. He's in the 1920s, so he's obviously more contemporary to us than he would be to 2,300 years ago with the ancient Greeks. But today, so you can say even for us, it's been forgotten. We may want to take on this thing called metaphysics. When people say, well, what is, what is metaphysics? What does that actually mean? Metaphysis, fusis nature you know in the greek or something that unconceals itself from nature nature as revealing and meta is something beyond or above nature so physics fuses physics as we mentioned i use a lot of physics example that that they study nature they study matter material energy things that exist you can observe it you can use our human senses and reason to really unpack its complexity black holes stars galaxies the human biology the virus you know the immune system the brain computers that, that's all you know physical realm meta is on one end also both prior as an a priori or something that is not a part of nature but also something that goes way beyond it talk about transcendence and going beyond the here and now so that's how that term sort of you know, loosely speaking i know i'm simplifying you know, when it comes to philosophical definitions of this and for heidegger he has a lot of essays of what is metaphysics and introduction to metaphysics but like, what is metaphysics it's not physics. And so what that means also is that it's not social science. Psychology, sociology, anthropology, human beings, like scientists, they have to study real things, real people, cultures, societies, the human psychology, you know, our behavioral psychology. Why are we hardwired to do certain things in reactions to stimuli? So metaphysics isn't that. And although this began for Heidegger in his time, like most Europeans would think, okay, well, our concept of the West goes back to only Greece and Rome, ancient Greece and Rome. 
even Hegel in his philosophy of history says anything that wasn't part of that world is prehistory, which kind of sucks. So if you're not from Europe and you're not of European descent, white European descent, you're part of something called prehistory for Hegel. That would be ancient China, ancient India, Babylon, Syria, Persia, Egypt, even the Jews in the, um, the first temple period when they were under occupation by so many of these ancient empires. But that's, their, that's the narrow Eurocentric view of, of the origin of philosophy that you find in Hegel, certainly up to someone like him who lived during his Nazi period. The only thing that counts is white Western Europe. Hence these two pillars, Plato and Aristotle. At some point in our commentary, I'm going to come back to this, obviously. I'm not trying to be dismissive of this, this massive question right now, but what is philosophy and does Western philosophy require the exclusion, invisibilization, marginalization, um, erasure of the possibility of looking at the origin of philosophy in a new way that doesn't come from the West? Because we know for a fact there were great philosophical systems in all parts of the world. And think about indigenous communities. And look, what we call today Latin America, but wherever the indigenous existed, you know, prior to the formation of civilizations and cultures and their systems of thinking and writing and philosophy, you know, that's going to have to come into play too. We may have something to learn from everybody regarding this question of time and death. But for Heidegger, he's there. He's with this Plato and Aristotle. What is this metaphysics leading up to the logic of Hegel? Plato is... Um, you know, from the fifth century BCE, so roughly the 400s, and he is responsible of a number of texts. Some of them are considered treatises, very esoteric texts to talk about being and time and motion and eternity and what's a beginning and what's an end. And, you know, some of the greatest, you know, philosophical explorations and logical explorations of what these terms mean, what are their relationships, how do they partake of each other. But he's also famous for a number of dialogues where his hero, Socrates, you've heard of him, the first Western philosopher, the founder of Western philosophy, but he didn't write. Plato, his student, protege, did the writing. But of course, Plato, we know, was the creator of his own ideas. One of his dialogues, the Phaedo, discusses the trial that Socrates had endured. He was accused by the Athenian state of you know, causing problems and poisoning young people's minds and What's all this philosophy? What are you doing? And you know, we want to simplify that historical context, but went to a trial, so convicted and was given a death sentence. So in one of his dialogues, Plato is writing about Socrates, talking about our relationship to death. You know, and in that really interesting text, there's a lot of maneuvers between Socrates and this group of guys that are around him that are having a conversation with him. He's posing questions, they're posing questions, but he's the one really trying to explicate everything. Long story short, he comes to a conclusion where, you know, there must be the soul before it's born into a body. And um, therefore, there, after, the soul, after you die, the soul does leave to the body and then can continue on and go somewhere else. And for that very reason, all of our normal ways of thinking about, well, no, I shouldn't die, I'm innocent, in the case of Socrates, or it's unfair to have the death penalty or, or for the state to you know, execute somebody. There was a separate issue, ethical issues that a lot of people can debate, but in this context of Socrates, he sort of in a very methodical way tries to convince everyone around him why this, why he's willing to accept this death sentence and go through with it, which he does. He drinks his poison and he, he, he dies. But the whole text is about how philosophy is one big preparation for this event, this event of death. And um, don't want to get into the nuances of that. So already there's something incipient there for Heidegger that look, you know, these two guys, although they're way back there and you know they're ancients, uh, there's something that was embedded in there that they reflect deeply about some of these questions that he's going to take on, but in a in a in a reconstructed, renewed way, because in his time he thinks people don't really care or they think all the answers, all the the, the solutions and the answers to these big problems, they've already been given by whoever, and there's no reason to ta take on this project. It's already finished. It's all settled. What are you doing? Why are you wasting everybody's time? Aristotle, for his part, um, you know, the student of Plato, who then takes off and creates his own tradition, one of the most influential philosophers, obviously, in the Western tradition, affecting thousands of years of foundational thinking from the Middle Ages until the, the modern period which comes into being in 
questions his basically all of his theories. But it's his metaphysics that one can say is quite enduring. You, know, you can dismiss Aristotle on biology and anything, you know, other fields. But when it comes to the metaphysics, well, why is metaphysics different from other branches of knowing? And, and scientists, as Aristotle will say, scientific knowing, scientists have to prove things that exist and uh, study and analyze things that exist. They don't speculate about myth, about things that don't exist and try to come up with scientific laws, like a unicorn, a horse with a, or Pegasus, the flying horse. Um, so that's scientific, no, we know what they do. They, they, things have to exist and then they try to explain what they are and tell you, you know, how they operate. Um, intelligence, which is more of what would become something like ethics, is like, how do you make a good decision for yourself or for your community? How do you make the right decision, good decision? Got a bunch of choices to make. Well, why would you choose this decision over there? Intelligence, cleverness, and, and a way of you know, navigating the possibilities to do what's right in the decision, which requires thinking. You know, that's that's one, that's another one branch. Techne or practical understanding, both know-how. You just sort of like some people just know how to get things done. They just you know they don't have to really reflect on it and think about it. They they have experience, or it's habitual for them. Maybe they're really good at it. They got the internal sense. They got a lot of experience. I know how to navigate that neighborhood. I know what you know what to do and how to do that. Or actually building things, techne, technology, building things out of nature. To put the you know, that takes a very specialized branch of like knowing, and it's not specialized as in it may not have to be specialized as in something a technical branch, but it takes a certain, you know, some people just have that know-how. There are a lot of things that I don't have know-how about. I mean, I don't know, not that great really can't play golf but to figure out how to but don't have time and may have my own criticism of, of how that sport manipulates a lot of land space that could be going towards other things but be that as man i want to come off as a cynic some people love that sport they admire it's, it's heroes but you know you, there's a know-how and it obviously takes a skill but there's just a way to just navigate how to play that that sport and get through a golf course so it's not he's not going to talk about scientific knowing he's not going to talk about ethics and intelligence he's not going to talk about technical understanding practical know-how what about understanding? That's another branch. It's sort of like sciences, but it can also be other branches of knowledge. It's like you want to get to the causes of things. Scientists want to study the Big Bang, the origin of the universe. First cause is like, how did something start? How did life on, on Earth start? How was this virus born? And what's it going to take to kill it, to, do, to stop it? So first cause is like, how does somebody begin their study? And, and there, so I was like, okay, yeah, a lot of people to undertake those ways of knowing and thinking, studying them, but there must be another type of knowledge out there where if there's a divine being, and there's no Christianity when Aristotle's around, that's zero. He's 300 BC, well, three, you know, the 300s. So he's not talking about theology in that sense, the theology of the Christian Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, or a monotheistic or unified God. You know, he doesn't have that. So he can't, theos, logos, logos, word, reason of theos, God. He doesn't have that. But he says, you know, if there's a divine being, so he opens up. And it has to have its own science. Scientists study physical matter, but this divine being, it wants its own science. Therefore, the science has to be divine. The divine science of a divine being. So a divine being has to pose a divine science about what it truly is. And this is how he starts to begin. And the first sections of metaphysics in the first book is just phenomenal. He's like, well, human beings really can't undertake this because they just study themselves. And they're limited by human reason to study human beings and everything else. So the scientists are human beings. So they're going to have to use their human reason through their observation experiment to study things that are not human, like the physical universe. But Aristotle here in this metaphysics, he's not talking about that. He's like saying there's a divine being. It has a divine science. It has to have something very peculiar to it that enables it to do that that human beings can't do. And he goes, maybe this is something, this, he uses the word God, but he says, maybe this is only a branch of knowledge that only God could have. Certainly not human beings. Almost just like you and I can't know the true divinity of Jesus, only through faith, but we can't be him, and we can't inhabit him, and we can't have a pure conception revealed to him about what his relationship is with the Father. He says, only through me can you get to the Father. No one has ever seen God. He's wrong. The Gospels. So... Only he's he, in other words, and he may have a knowledge or a secret you know, knowledge of the relationship between him and his father that has been revealed to us through faith and intuition and feeling. We can truly believe it as in the most 
foundational truth, but we don't we wouldn't know what that inhabiting the relationship between him and his father is like when he has that. It's an analog to Christianity. And again, I'm not it's not a lesson in Christian theology. But Aristotle is saying, look, you know, whatever being has a special knowledge, it's not going to be a human being. There are famous places like what is the metaphysician? He's, you know, can't be man, human. He's either an animal or a god. We talked about the animal, we talked about God, we talked about maybe a renewed relationship. And we think about the animal as something that's not just an inferior version of ourselves because they don't have reason. Maybe they're beyond us. And for Aristotle, God is in, you know, not the human realm. And for Heidegger, this all goes back down to I give you this long excursion into Plato and Aristotle because it's not that we're going to be spending time with those two. And at this juncture, Heidegger says, well, whatever they started, it just kind of like trickles down to the Western tradition until you get to Hegel in 1807, the 1800s. The famous work is in 1807, The Phenomenology of Spirit, which Heidegger will encounter at the end of Being in Time, but a number of other works. I mentioned his philosophy of history, for example. But here, you know, Heidegger, it's, it's, this is where we have to be a little critical of Heidegger. He's basically saying that whatever started with the ancient Greeks just kind of gets touched up and reworked and re-evolves until you get to the table. But now in his present, in those 1920s, all this has in a way become very trivialized and he's gonna give us something so brand new. You know, here's Plato 400, and here's all 300, Hegel 1800. And he, here he is long after that, long after the ancient Greeks and about 120 you know, 20 years after Hegel. He's gonna do something that no one's ever done in the Western tradition. Imagine that the megalomania, imagine in trying to like save the world. Like, what are you, Superman? What are you, you just, you're not a human being, Heidegger, or you're, who gave it up to you? Who made you the person to you know, take on everything that 2,300 years of Western philosophy hasn't been able to pose correctly and even try to answer. That's that first paragraph. And then the second paragraph I'll read and then we'll move to the, the last third of our session today in terms of just sort of an explication about the broader context. So coming back to Heidegger's text, this is the second paragraph, page 21, the beginning of the introduction. That last sentence from the first paragraph says, uh, and what they rested, meaning from Plato and Aristotle all the way down to Hegel, what they rested with the utmost intellectual effort from the phenomenon, fragmentary and incipient though it was, has long since become trivialized. Here's the second paragraph. Not only that, on the basis of the Greeks' initial contributions towards an interpretation of being, a dogma has been developed which not only declares the question about the meaning of being to be superfluous, but sanctions its complete neglect. It is said that being, with a big B, is the most universal and the emptiest of concepts. As such, it resists every attempt at definition. Nor does this most universal and hence indefinable concept require any definition, for everyone uses it constantly and already understands what he means by it. In this way, that which the ancient philosophers put on Aristotle found continually disturbing as something obscure and hidden has taken on clarity and self-evidence such that if anyone today, meaning his time and you can say even our time, continues to ask about it, it, it is he who is charged with an error of method. Okay, so that's, where, that's all we're going to read today. I gave you the first paragraph, excuse me, played on Aristotle. Now this stuff. You know, why, why is Heidegger going? Okay, so on the one hand, remember that interpretation, Auslegung versus inter interpretation. You know, if you want to interpret being, you can do it theoretically and systematically, and maybe you can use those other branches, non-philosophy, social science, sciences, try to explicate it, theoretical exposition. Or what about the other version, Auslegung, the something as something. So the Greeks started something that's very mysterious for them. Our relationship to them, quite frankly, you know, you want to say they're way back then, and yet for Heidegger, there is a temporal mystery buried back there that our minds want to automatically chronologize. Like I just said, 400 BCE, 300 BCE, Christ is zero, 
you know, from our standpoint now, we got to temporalize time that way and think, okay, that they're way back there. But for Heidegger, all of that kind of forgets and buries something else that occurred that had a little start, a little spark. And in that, there was a space of obscurity and mystery. So don't think of this as way back there and they're ancient and they're not developed and they're not as sophisticated as we are and we're smarter and we're advanced, we progress, we have industrialization, technology, capitalism, science. Now those, those, two, those two guys in particular, but I mean, they, they, there, was, there was a, something occurred, something broke in and it was so disturbing and so strange and so obfuscated, it wasn't clear. Um, oh, there we go. Nice. Again, I'm not reading. Now I'm just expositing, but I gotta go back to the account. So I have the text, the higher text up to the left. That's why sometimes I go that way to read, but when I'm talking to you, maybe looking down away from the camera, but here. So there, there's uh, an obscurity there, and yet Heidegger says a couple of things. Either we just assume that we got over the hump you know, they did what they could, and then we just evolved to the point where we figured it out, so we no longer have to talk about it. And if anyone wants to resurrect the question or try to take it on again or make it, remystify it and go into it a new way, come out with a new way of thinking, a lot of us are, you know, aspire to that. We know how we think now. We know history in terms of what everything has been given to us. But what if we want to do something brand new? You want to be creative. You want to come up with something brand new. You want to think about something in a new way. He says, if you take that approach in his time, well, you'll be considered crazy. You'll be considered someone who doesn't realize that it, what's been said is done and what's done is done and that's it. Case closed, like a cold case. We've solved it, done. Why are you going to go reopen this and try to go back in there? So he says, today, we're afraid to ask the question or we think it's done. So anyone who does is going to be dismissed. On the other hand, today, I think about our times. Right? That's how I opened up the first part of this session today. Um, either we don't think about it, or it's it's so it, we take it for granted that things are, we are, I am, you are, it is right now. This is happening to us, the quarantine and the virus. We take it for granted. We know this is. We know you're not dreaming. This is not some parallel universe where this is happening. It's here. It's, it's right now. It's here. And yet, for Heidegger, you know, even any sense of being there, does like being here right now, being is being, and this is what it means. It's like it's totally universal because you need that to say anything about anything. On the other hand, it's totally empty because, in a way, we're empty. We're empty in two ways. We're empty because we don't can't provide the mystery that happened to the ancient Greeks and kind of like be so perplexed by it, but also use everything we got to like go in there and probe it to its steps. It takes a lot of willpower and horsepower to try to do that. You can't be complacent. You got to be resolute in, in throwing yourself into a mystery that can completely absorb you and take you over. It's got to be a passion in you that lights up where, you know, you're not just like, oh, okay, well, it's just some other thing I can do today. No, this takes over everything. Think about an artist or, or a musician, Beethoven, or Mozart, or whoever. They're completely consumed with their work. Their life is their work. They're creating it out of their self. And, you know, the rest of us get to be the recipients of, of these beautiful creations. So similarly in philosophy, you know, the ancient Greeks experienced it. But today, it's, it's so empty. It's so dry and, and, and desiccated. And there's really nothing left to do. And on top of that, if you want to break from the norm or the mainstream and everyone's saying, hey, why are you worried about this? Or okay, if you want to have some, if you want a hobby to explore the ancient Greeks, go ahead. But if you're really going to be serious about doing this right now, you're, you know, no one's going to take you seriously. And for all of us, we all have something. You know, we do something, maybe we're in a certain vocation profession or we have certain responsibilities to elders or families maybe we're caretakers you know we're, we're all doing something and for heidegger to assume that this is just another vocational task and that 
the main character, as we said in this book, which is going to turn out not to be a human being, has to take on this question again, this question of the meaning of being, the necessity, structure, and priority of this question of being. That's the title of the chapter says. Not start from the human. We're not going to replay what the ancient Greeks said. He's going to meet Hegel at the end, but for now he's going to lump Hegel into everybody else. He's just the most advanced version that ever came about from this tradition. And here's Heidegger doing something totally different. But to think about what he, he wants to start on here requires us to be honest about how we really don't have the answer today. He's 1927, but what about our times, 20, 2020? Do we really have the answer? Do we want to run away from it and say, well, um, it's not worth thinking about, or, oh, I thought it was already solved. Are we going to abdicate responsibility to all those other branches of knowledge? You got to trust the politicians. You got to trust, you know, um, different uh, different community organizations. You got to trust what you learn in college or you know, trained in a profession. You got to look at your professional sphere. You got to, uh, you know, trust the um, your religious leaders. As hard as that may sound, you know, they, they're the ones, they may not explicate philosophically the theory of being, but they disclose to you why your life and your commitments and your commitment to not only the religion within your, that you're within, let's say to God, if there's God in that religion, but to each other, to a community, and how love and compassion and sympathy and empathy are at the heart of every religion, and that the human matters at the end of the day. That's in the religious context. But for Heidegger, you can't turn to anyone. Uh, this is going to be very difficult to start. You cannot turn to yourself. You can't turn to somebody else. You can't turn to any authority that you think confers the knowledge or experience or laws or codes or um, systems of belief. Wherever you draw your assessments from, it's not always religious authorities or your governments or you know, your profession. Maybe you have a boss or you are the boss and you report to a board, you know, or, or just think about your own community. You know, you associate with a group of friends and or maybe it's your, your family, of course, as the kids grow up, they're, they're, just, they're at the heart of everything you do, of course. But you also have your own community. You got your friends. It's not just your colleagues at work, but, you know, you do things. You associate. Hence this social distancing, it's killing everybody because we're not programmed that way. We're used to being with others. And this is where, uh, you know, the beginning of being in time, it's, it's, it, we have to shift to another mindset entirely. We can't start with being present here right now in those systems of relationships and family and community and, and you know, this human composition. And it's gonna turn out that by suspending all that and, and leaving that behind for a second, for Heidegger, it's the only way we're going to actually get back to the possibility of answering this question of what it means to be. And as human beings, we're caught up in being, so it's going to be our meaning too, but it's not going to come from anything else. And anything that you've ever thought or anything you've ever considered or anything that is, you know, up to Heidegger, anything that was written before him, he's going to try to disclose something. That's the audacity of this project the question of the meaning of being he's going to take that on it's universal it's necessary it has a structure it's never been articulated and if you go with everything prior to heidegger and if you go with everything in his time before he wrote this it's all empty it's either empty no one it doesn't mean anything which is not a good position to be in because i think we're questing for me right now especially in the face of mass death you know, nothing matters more than why why are we suffering? Why, why do human beings have to even endure something like death? Why couldn't we be born? So we're not eternal. We do have a birth. But once we come to being, we can just kind of last forever. That's not how we're built. So there can't be a question right now that's more important, if you ask me. Why? And I don't want to speculate what's going to happen after the virus or, you know, where do we go from here? Or maybe we move to another planet. And we can continue our life indefinitely there. Or maybe the biotechnology can come in and, as I said, freeze or delay life. And 
wait till we, we awaken a future and then have a solution to eternal life. As if that's the answer, and maybe if we even got that as an option, who knows if we that's the right way. You can watch movies about that. Oh yeah, I can discover the fountain of youth and eternal life, but what if it's something that you know you think, oh hmm, that sounds like a good idea, but when you actually do it, you're like, now I miss something about all that complexity and concern about human life, or what Socrates was saying about, well, there's a way to think about our relationship to death in a way that doesn't have to be based on fear or like, you know, we're losing something, but we could be gaining something. Leave Socrates aside. We're going to go back to the religions later, too, and see how they probe this question of death and life and the meaning of life. But with Heidegger, we are going to have to attempt to answer this meaning of being. Last time we said meaning is not signification, something representing something. You know, this book means this, this passage in the Bible. This passage means this, this parable or saying in Jesus, the mustard seed, or, you know, parable about the rich man. Say, okay, I want to join you. Well, give up all your wealth. Come along. No, I can't. I got I get all those responsibilities. And, you know. You can't have mammon, money, and God. When people say, hey, should we pay taxes to the Romans? You know, what are we going to do? Should we pay taxes? Or are, we, are you offering us something beyond this oppression? He goes, well, show me one of your coins. He goes, well, what does it say? He goes, Who, whose who's picture is on that? He goes, oh, the, the Roman emperor. He goes, well, give the things that belong to Caesar to Caesar. And give the things that belong to God to God, spirit. So he, he bifurcates things there. There are ways to understand giving and being and being gift being gifted with that gift of being in all these other systems that are quite beautiful. Every, I think, religious tradition and all their millions, billions of adherents have something beautiful to offer to you know their adherents. Some religions I'm critical of. I'm not gonna mention than now in this context, but that's another matter. That's probably a whole other series on these questions of justice and inequality that exist within the world's relations, because that's true too. A lot of pain and oppression and disaster and torture over the millennia. All the religions. And in this day and age, quite frankly, it doesn't matter what the world religion is, there's some religious minority somewhere that's suffering in their country because of that dominant religion. And all are implicated. We're not having a discussion about that about the politics of, of inequality and injustice in, in the world religions and why religions continue if we know that's the case. Coming back to the philosophical work of being in time, the meaning of being is not what something means, it's not what Jesus meant in that passage, or it's not what someone might interpret in a Shakespearean play or, or poem. It's not what you want to decode in a lab about an indication you're going to, they're going along, going for the vaccines and something appears and suddenly there's a shift and a new piece of data or a new reaction occurs and you're like, wow, we haven't seen it. What does that mean? We're not doing that work. Being, we already went through some lengths last time. It's not small being, beings, all of us, anything that's present can't be God either. I mean, the conceptions of it within the world religions and it's certainly going to involve a very complex relationship between this who of that's raising this question of meaning of being and one easy way i would just say i got the answer to the who it's got to be heidegger he's the author he wrote the book he's the one that is posing this question it's not um oscar the grouch from sesame street it's heidegger right isn't he the, the no it's not him either you're like, well, this is, you're starting to lose me here. He's the one writing the book, right? He wrote the book, and he's the one that cares. His neighbor didn't write it. He did it. Now, the Dasein, as we said, can't even start there. But because it's going to be what it is, it's going to involve everything that is. Well, what did I just say? And everything that is is not just everything that's present as the world or in the world. And yet we're in it. And that eerie kind of contrast. It's an amazing moment in the Gospels where I think it's in 
somewhere between John 13 and 17, you know, Jesus saying he's in the world, but not of it, but he's no longer in the world. And so I'm just wondering, what is, what is Heidegger trying to steal maybe or cover up? You know, Jesus is saying some really strange things too, in the world, but not of it, or leaving the world before he gets arrested, tried, executed, and then resurrected. He's like saying, I'm no longer in the world, I'm outcome of the world. I'm talking to disciples, he's washed their feet, they've had their supper, and now he's talking to the Father, and he's saying, okay, I'm no longer here in the world, I'm going to come back to you and give me the, you know, existence I had before the foundation of the world. There's all kinds of things happening. He's still alive, you know, but something is happening there. His temporalization of being is, you know, he's almost talking about himself in the past tense, even though he's still around. These are going to come back to us because as we move closer to time and death, that'll be division two. But what Heidegger is getting at is that understand a couple of things at this juncture. That Dasein is, when we say being there, being here, it's never present or an enclosed entity, like something in the world. And the world itself and its totality is not just that. Dasein does have a totality, though, and a wholeness to it, which he's going to struggle to articulate it's ultimately gonna have some kind of structure to it. It's gonna have a being with a big B and that's gonna be this thing called care, as I mentioned. And care is not just, I care about X, Y, and Z projects or people or things, where have these responsibilities? It's a concern about that question of the meaning of being given this horizon of how you're handling your own finitude. Therefore, this question of how time and being are interlocked in the construction of who we are, but escapes us because it's not physical time. It's not counting up your birthdays. And yet it has everything to do with being a human being because we know we weren't, as I mentioned, can be born, but we don't live forever. It's not like we don't have a birth and a death. You know? As if we're always pre-existent. Jesus is pre-existent with this body. Not that. And yet we're gonna radically transcend the ability of even living in linear time to be disclosed to us in a moment of how all past, present, and future interlock and intermingle and kind of co-penetrate each other, as he says. You know, how we're going to come to be our having business that arises not from tomorrow, what's tomorrow, Tuesday, but it's going to come towards us, not from the outside. Uh, you know, something's coming towards, you know, the bird is coming towards my window right now. So it's not coming, not physical that way. I'm not going into tomorrow, Tuesday. That's all spatial stuff. But we're going to kind of come out of, you know, what we are, what we will have been, and what we're supposed to be, and what we are coming to be. All this is going to emerge from the source. And it's the mystery of being in time to, to really get to that level. Everything else for me, this is just me talking is secondary. I'm not too concerned about, you know, what do we do with things that are, as he says, ready to hand or present hand, things that are useful for us. Mm -hmm. My tea here. But we have to get to this question of this different sense of temporality that underpins not a myth. Yeah, this isn't fiction, by the way. This isn't just sort of like, oh, okay, we're screwing around here and just say whatever we want, make up some stuff. We're, we're, we're a creative writer, literary person, you know, the novel or something. That's what art's for in literature. It has its purpose. And we love it. It's great. A lot of people like it. We go to the movies. We, we, we're mystified by the science and the fiction, the imagination we come up with. It's great movies. The superheroes, if you like that stuff, you know, wow, it'll be interesting. The Hulk and the Iron Man. What? Not real, Superman. But it's fun. Yeah, it's fun to watch that magic. Okay, wow. Beyond being a human being. Can't go down that route. Because we are talking about, at the deepest level, what we truly are. Unfortunately, that's going to require changing completely how you think and how you've been thinking, most likely, if you haven't read Heidegger's Big in Time, which is what we're trying to do. Change our conception to both time, as we're not going to be in time, we're not within time, we're not expiring in time, as time, time's not just in us, even though we feel we're getting older. And death is not watching somebody else die or a stoppage point. You know? My wife and I, we don't like to kill flies. She likes to like, put them in a cup, have me take it. I have to go out and take it outside. But we don't like to kill the little insects and 
it's a spider or a fly we want them to live so but you know a lot of people kill the insect they, they, you think okay i stop you, know, crushing it, you stop it you see that that's death there's gonna be a revolutionary way to think about death that is so real but it's not what you think it is time and death are going to factor into this in a very very complex way but for now right here at the outset understand the context understand the ambition that's a word that's not used oftentimes especially today things are so specialized but you know he's he's going for it all my thesis is and it's not mine everybody else can debate i've mentioned this before debate it did he did he succeed did he fail why did he fail okay he gave it up we can't we can't jump to that but right now whether he succeeds or not let's just leave it but he's launching it hence the introduction that perhaps being is going to be time and vice versa but not being in time and time having any being is not going to be these guys plato aristotle all whipped hegel saying what the really what the mystery of time is therefore death and why time is at all and what's its distinction with eternity and if we start to question that all those constructions which we know all those philosophies that underpin all the other great world religions we can take christianity for example we can think about the medieval scholastic contributions to islam from a beautiful religion in its own right 13th century you know islamic thinking about the deepest relationship between the revelation from the quran and the, the kind of philosophical metaphysical foundations of being all these great traditions but with heidegger um that entire history of philosophy and therefore the history of religion that it supports the philosophy support the different religions he's not gonna he's not gonna deal with that he's not gonna go in there he's gonna go somewhere else and it's up to us to figure out whether we want to follow that so to round out uh today's session um just some concluding remarks before we move to the next page in this introduction you know i want to revisit some of the things i said to start off the session what motivated me to start this is to think about we can ask the question why is it why is it, why is this virus happening and why is the reaction that we've taken been the case and what has radically changed and how does that make us feel and what's changing in our consciousness and our psychology without us even knowing it you start to do this for a few five six weeks radically changing the way you normally do your thing as an adult the kind of freedoms that you think you might have as an adult. Kids, of course, you know, they have to obey their parents and follow, follow the rules of the house. But, you know, adults usually have freedom that we don't have. So you might try to bring all that into focus and think, okay, well, this is how I feel what I'm going through right now. That's extremely unsettling. It's creating anxiety. I'm not just nervous about the future that I can't just go back to normal. And we may not go back to normal. I'm stuck in the present, but I don't know if that means I have all this freedom. Hey, I don't get to go, I don't have to go to the office. Or if I'm so upset with myself that I'm not maximizing my productivity within the present that I normally wouldn't have it in normal circumstances. Maybe I need to spend this time writing a, a poem or painting an artwork or, or learning a new language and just adding to my existence that I normally wouldn't do in a busy world. So we that's our normal inclination is to like react to the situation. And of course, the sheer anxiety of some of us may know people that have the virus, I'm sure you do, and have lost somebody already. Those are real pressures that are totally unshaking our foundations. And my inclination is that, okay, in this moment of utter danger and fear and concern is going to be the possibility, if we see it as such, a disclosure of hope that reveals to us what we truly are as our being in a way that nothing we've heard so far can. What do I mean? The governors of our states, the mayors of our cities, the religious leaders that speak to us, the federal government, the national government, and the current person who is the president. They can talk all day long about what they think is this case and that. We're going to transcend that. We have to transcend that to get to the deepest root to understand with Heidegger, why is it that we feel the way we do? So we don't just start with the assumption that this is how we feel. And this is what's happening. We've got to get to a deeper ground 
to even understand why this possibility of us being the way we are and reacting in the way we are to time and death and uncertainty, why is that the case? And could there be something totally other that hasn't been revealed by any religion or any other philosophical system? I mentioned the word scary. In a way, it is kind of scary. Uncanny is the German pride of it. Unheimlich means outside of your home, not familiar, outside the familiar, completely displaced into this realm of otherness. But it is definitely a different realm. And we're going to see if we can go into that realm. And I assure you that when I finish the commentary, however long that's going to take, but my own hypothesis, I said that in my opening remarks, I'm not just trying to read Heidegger. You can take courses on this. You can see lectures on it. You can get a good grasp on it. Just like you want to learn a language, you can do the work to do that, to really get into this. There's some great commentators out there. No, I, I'm just appropriating this work to respond to our times, to develop what I have as an insight regarding time and death that I don't think has been articulated before because I mentioned it's not a three past, present, and future. That doesn't mean total timelessness, but what we might think the afterlife is, we die, what we might think heaven might be, or reincarnation, if that's what the belief system is. I'm gonna suspend that for a second. I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm talking about the structure of what is that hasn't been disclosed yet because no one has articulated it. And that would be this kind of four, four, axes um, of time because we, we have familiarity with past, present, and future at least ideas of what those things mean but this fourth is where we're going to go so thank you again for joining me today you can find this recording as sampath on heidegger session three we will move to the next page we finished one page here of the introduction page 21 we'll move to page 22 in the next session do a reading of that and begin to explore um you know what we've started so thank you for joining me